Chapter 2. On the Road Gavin says, open quotation, Gareth is sitting on one of two sofas in his manager Simon Fuller's office. In between the sofas, exotic fresh flowers decorate a low table, which sits on the deepest, softest rug you've ever seen. The office's state-of-the-art audio and video equipment is all switched off, and there is an overall feeling of peace. Gareth's got a stinking cold, but he's in a good mood. And while I'm fiddling with the tape recorder, he's happy to sign photos for his fan club and a good luck card for a friend's daughter who's in the middle of her GCSEs. Once settled, Gareth starts talking about the tour. End quotations. Gareth says, open quotations, The tour that Will, Zoe and I did was an awesome experience. It came quite quickly after Pop Idol tour that all ten finalists did together. So I was a bit worried that no one would want to come and see us. I needn't have worried at all. Everywhere we went, the crowds were huge. We played fantastic venues including London Arena, Wembley Arena, Sheffield Arena, Newcastle Telewest Arena, Nottingham Arena, Manchester Evening News Arena, Birmingham NEC and Glasgow SECC. <laughs> it was a huge show with pyrotechnics, a proper band, a stage that went right out into the middle of the crowd and loads and loads of amazing lights. We even had girls dancing in cages on the stage. I think they were supposed to be competition winners in each town, but I'm sure one or two of them came everywhere with us. Anyway, it was cheaper than getting proper dancers. If you were one of the people who came to the show, then I hope you enjoyed it. The people that the audience sees on the stage every night are just the tip of the iceberg. On tour, there's a whole army of people that are with you to make sure that everything happens. Everything's covered. Drivers, set builders, lighting, sound... Security, wardrobe, hair and makeup, the band, backing singers, dancers, tour managers, personal assistants, and us. The team we had was excellent. When I go out onto the tour on my own, I want to take some of the same people around with me. It's important for me to build a team that I want to be around me for the rest of my career, like a personal assistant, hair and makeup, people who support me. Sometimes on a tour, the artists tend to stay out of the way and not get matey with the crew, but I like to get involved in everything. I make a lot of friends that way. It's especially useful to have a friend in artist catering. There'll always be something on the menu that I like. We, tra we, tra we, tra <laughs> we travelled between venues on the really cool double-decker tour bus. It had 10 or 12 bunk beds upstairs, a kitchen area with a microwave, a DVD player and a video, even a PlayStation. Obviously the whole tour entourage didn't fit on the bus. Our bus was just Will Zoe and me, our personal assistants, the tour manager and some security people. I made sure I had first choice of the bunks. I set up a little recording studio in one of my bunks because I was starting to write stuff for the second album. I had my laptop and my keyboard and some little speakers. We were driving along and I'd be bouncing up and down trying to play bits on the keyboard. It's lucky I don't get travel sick. When we arrive in a city, we all check into our hotels. The artists stay in one hotel and most of the crew stay in a different hotel. We stayed in some top hotels and some most of the time we got the best rooms, the suites. There was one time that we complained. When we went to Birmingham, I checked in, and I was sitting in my room looking around, and I thought to myself, it's just not very nice. Then my room phone went, and it was Will. He said, these rooms aren't very nice, are they? I agreed. So we went down and asked if we could move. That's typical me. I had to wait until somebody else didn't like them before doing anything about it. I do have to say that the rooms they moved us to were lovely. If I'm able to save my money, I will do. On the tour, there are free meals every day in catering. Technically, it's not free, because eventually I'll have to pay for it out of album sales or whatever. But at the time, it feels like it's free. I'd always eat backstage. Every day, I'd take loads of cans from catering, put them in my bag, and use the minibar at the hotel to keep them cool. That way, I didn't spend so much on room surface. Prices in hotels can just be stupid. There were some really late nights on tour. Really late. Some nights, we were up until 5 or 6 in the morning, just having a laugh and being stupid. You can't be that late every night though, because you have to be able to perform the next day. When we were in Manchester, we decided we'd want a night out, so the party was arranged in the club. It was well cool. Normally though, we were just in the hotel bar on someone's suite. A couple of times I bought drinks for the whole bar, but then you get complete strangers going, yeah I'll have one. You can't do that every night either, you'd end up broke. Having said that, I've never woken up and thought, I still can't do this today. I'm really good with being tired and still performing. I've trained myself to power nap. I can sleep anywhere, and I mean anywhere. Even if I've got 20 minutes between meetings, I can just drop off and catch up in my sleep. If I didn't do that, I'd never be able to cope with my schedule. What made it more tiring for me was the fact that I was promoting the long and winding road. Suspicious Minds, at the time. 
Some days I was up and down the country like a yo-yo. When everyone else on tour was going from city to city, I'd be up at the crack of dawn, down to London to do a TV show or something, then back up to wherever they were just in time to go on stage. It was madness. I didn't sleep in my own hotel room every night. Sometimes mum and dad would come to see me, and they'd take, me over, they'd take over my suite. I'd have to call Zoe up and ask if I could stop with her in her room. We'd stay up all night messing around, just chatting. She's such a laugh. There was no love action for me on the tour, which is a bit sad really, what with all those fancy hotel rooms. I didn't get any booty calls on the room phones. But there was a lot of flirting going on at the parties. You know what it's like. Talking. Maybe some dancing. I couldn't really do anything because there were always journalists in the hotels. The temptation is always there. Because you're there and there's loads of girls near you who are just ready. You have to tell yourself, whoa, steady on. Without my sister there keeping the girls away, I have to be my own minder. And that's dangerous. I do trust myself though. Another incredible thing about touring and staying in hotels is that the fans always find out where I'm staying, most of the time before I do. Sometimes they book into the hotels they wait outside, even if it's raining. It would be nice to be able to invite them all in, but that would be mad. We're not the only people staying at the hotel, and it would disturb the other guests, who would be a bit annoyed if we invited loads of people in. Instead, on certain chat to them. They don't get invited up to the room, but I do like to chat to them. When we were in Holland, it was raining the worst I've ever seen. These two Dutch girls slept outside the venue just so they'd be able to see me. You should have seen them. They were proper soaked, and their sleeping bags were like swimming pools. They were only about 16. The best bit about touring has to be the actual show. The crowds, the lights, the noise. That's what it's all about. It's what I've always dreamed of doing. When I'm on stage, I wear this bug thing in my ear that lets me hear the music in my voice. Without it, I wouldn't be able to tell which song the band are playing. Because the crowd are so loud, it's unbelievable. I hold the record for the loudest scream. What my crowd do? Not me. The sound guys on the tour worked with the Beatles ages ago, so they know about everything. When Will and I were doing the last bit, when we walk out onto the stage in the middle of the crowd, we're completely surrounded by fans. It's so hard to hear. It's hard for the sound guys who are on stage looking at the sound guys pointing up, which means, can you turn up the volume of my earpiece so we can hear? The sound guys are just shrugging because it's already at full volume. It's crazy. They told us they'd never heard anything as loud since the hysteria that used to happen when the Beatles performed. It was a massive thrill to hear that, a real plus. I love all that though. I like looking out for cool banners. They're miles away, I can't see them. Without the house lights on, you can only see about the first ten rows, and after that you can just see those glow sticks and flashing things that people have. But if people near the front have banners, then I'll definitely read them. On the Pop Idol tour, when all ten of us were on stage for the finale, there was a man massive banner that said, Gareth, fancy a shag, in huge letters. We all saw it, and all ten of us were laughing our heads off. It was so funny. Is that approach going to work? Put it this way, it's always nice to be noticed. I do like to flirt with the audience. I try and flirt with everyone in the whole venue. I try and make the, everyone in the crowd think, Oh yeah, he's looking at me. They should think that, because I am. One thing I want to try and do when I'm on my tour is talk to the crowd between songs. On the last tour, there were loads of clever things we did, like showing me text in the crowd on the big screen, or holding up cards with stuff I wanted to say. I want to be able to be spontaneous with the crowd, react to things they're shouting, you know. They all know I've got a stammer, so there's not really any pressure on me. The tour went really smoothly, apart from one of the Newcastle shows. I nearly died in Newcastle. I had a near-death experience. The stage had two scaffolding towers, one on each side, with steps that led up to the platform. On my first song, the Michael Jackson one, The Way You Make Me Feel, I ran across the stage up the steps and go on onto the edge of the platform to get as near as I could to the crowd at the sides. Because it's my first song, I was right into it, with my adrenaline pumping and the crowd going mad. Anyway, around these platforms there were two safety bars, one about chest high and one about thigh high. There was also a kind of panel like a skirting board that stops your feet from going over the edge. It's very safe. Except for this one in Newcastle. I was full into it, you know, bouncing across the stage, the way you make me I feel, and I go running up the steps of this tower. You really turn me on? I got to the platform and moved towards the edge and I skidded. Usually the panel would stop my footing from going over the edge, but that night for some reason it wasn't there. My feet went right over the edge and I slipped under the safety bars. The microphone was in my right hand so I reached out with my left hand and luckily managed to grab one of the safety bars. I looked down and I could see right over the guitar tech area. Thirty feet below me there were loads of guitars pointing up like jagged rocks. I remember thinking, if I fall now, I'll be wrecked. I would at least have broken my back. The stupid part was that all this time I kept on singing. There I am, thirty feet up, and I'm still singing. 
you knock me off my feet, eat, eat. I think the crowd thought it was part of my act. They didn't seem worried, but they just kept on cheering. They did all go, ooh, at one point, but I think they thought I did it every night. I managed to pull myself back onto the platform my left hand and carry on with the show, but it was proper scary. Put it this way, I made sure the panel was there every night after that. On tour, it's kind of a tradition to play jokes on the artist on the last night. For one song, the piano wasn't working. They brought it out to the stage and it wouldn't work. So there was me, sat there, nothing. For ages I was saying, what's happening with this piano? I had to start the song without any music. I'm still not sure whether that was a joke or just a dodgy piano. There was one thing that definitely was a joke. If I went to the show, you'll remember the bit every night where I pretend to argue with the guitarist about what song we're going to do. On the last night we started arguing like normal and the whole band just walked off stage. I was like, what am I going to do? It was hard for me because of my speech. I couldn't just yell the crowd what was happening. So I just stood there for about five minutes. If you've never stood in front of a big crowd doing absolutely nothing, then let me tell you, five minutes is a long time. The crowd went quiet for a bit when they realised something was up. Then they all, start to, they all started chanting, Gareth, Gareth, Gareth. Eventually I managed to get it together, enough to beg the band. Please come back, please. To get them back for that in the last song, the Elvis number, I went round the whole band one by one with a microphone and made them all sing. They hated that. I can't wait for the tour on my own, and hopefully something big will happen in 2004, and hopefully you'll be there. Yes, you reading the book. I mean you. See you there.